Good morning, Jesus Image family. Oh, what a joy and a privilege it is to be in the house of the Lord this morning, to call upon His name, to be His, to come together on this beautiful Pentecost Sunday and celebrating what the King of Glory has done as He has so selflessly poured His Spirit out. Thank you, Lord. There is a, the river of God is flowing. And now is not the time to be ankle deep. It's not the time to be waist deep, but we need to be all in. <laughs> Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Oh, Holy Spirit, we thank you, Lord. We welcome your presence. We thank you for the scarlet thread of your blood that has been woven through the generations, Lord. That you chose us long before we chose you. We thank you for your blood. We thank you for the finished work of the cross, that you are our inheritance. Holy Spirit, magnify and glorify Jesus today. Come in power and in might, and we love you in Jesus' name.
just one sheep and two men's purpose. One main reason for existence. All men's vain and high ambitions will one day be. Treasure you above all others. To love you like we love no one. And your greatness soon will be uncovered. And all the unknown and It's just one sheep and two men's worth There's one main reason for existence It's loving you And all men's made in high ambition Will one day be brought to treasure Treasure you are
We say yes to you, Lord. All is for that in all things you would have the first place. That in all things you would have preeminence. All is for. All
just sing that for another second, Aaron. Just Jesus have it all from the top. Oh, Jesus have it all. Jesus have it all. To you belongs the glory, the praise of all the world. Jesus have it all. Oh, Jesus have it all. A blessing and all honor, majesty and all. Jesus have it all. Jesus have it all. the voices Aaron again from the top just the voices come on church Lord Jesus have it all Jesus have it all to you belongs the glory the praise of all the world Jesus have it all Dear Jesus, we're aware that we're in your presence this morning. We welcome you, precious Holy Spirit. We ask you to have your way today. We will not put limitations on you, Holy Spirit, this morning. We're not here just to attend a service. We're here to be with you, Jesus. What an honor, what an honor to gather in your name, Jesus. We could gather anywhere, but today we get to be in your presence. We get to sit in your presence, Lord, and love you. That's why we're alive, Jesus. It's more real to us, Lord, than the air we breathe, God. We love you, Jesus. It is our joy and honor to love you this morning, God. You're all we need, Jesus, so you're all we need. Everything, God, is found in you, Lord. Healing is found in you, God. Salvation is found in you. Oh, Lord, every breakthrough that we could ever need is found in you, Lord. Everything we could ever need in life or want is found in you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, teach this generation to seek Jesus in him alone because he's all we need. Oh, Holy Spirit, make Jesus real. We worship you this morning. Amen. Amen. Oh, aren't you guys happy to be in the presence of the Lord? Can you let our worship team know how much you love them? You guys are amazing. 
Court, it's nice to have you back. I love you too. Thank you, David. You guys can go to your seats. You're amazing, all of you up here. How are you guys? Oh, man. How are you guys? There you go. There it is. Couple announcements real quick. Um, this Wednesday night here in this building, we will have youth and we don't like to announce who's coming, but my husband will be preaching at youth this Wednesday night. And uh, I don't know if they're very excited to have you at youth, Michael. Michael will be at youth. Uh, we really feel like God is doing something, there it is, in the youth. And uh, the youth is hungry for Jesus. We were watching some of these young kids worship this morning. We're going, man, I love what God is doing in this generation. Amen. Amen. So get here. This summer is going to be amazing for youth. And one more announcement. Jesus School is right around the corner. If you guys could put that information up there. If you haven't noticed, a lot of our students are not here. They're home for the summer and how we miss their fire. But you guys are, are zesty enough. I love it. It's, I can feel it, the fire. Um, but zesty, I, don't, I haven't used that word in like maybe 20 years, but it, I don't know why that just came to my mind, but it, uh, whatever. Um, but I have the honor of running Jesus School along with Amy and Ryan. And the hunger that you guys are seeing as you're interviewing these students this year, it's like none we've ever had before. As you know, we are now open to international students. So if you've been watching and you've been, we get emails all the time, when can I come be a part of Jesus School Orlando? Now is the time. You can register. All the information is up there. We also have an online option if you're not able to come. And we just... Um, got everything done with the articulation agreements. If you guys can put that up on the screen. You guys, this is a really big deal. Let me tell you why. Michael and I right now, we are actually getting our master's in theology, believe it or not, at Regent University. Like we didn't need anything extra to add to our plate, but it's changing our lives. Getting in the scripture and learning who Jesus is, there is nothing like it. And now our students, if you come to Jesus School, you have the opportunity to go to one of these amazing schools. You'll get uh, discounts, 20 to 30% off, correct? And you will get 20 earned credits. You guys, no? Each school, but the minimum is 20. You'll do that part? All right, let's just go to offering, okay? Let's go to offering. All right, Luke, go to Luke 16. Go to verse 10. Running church with your husband is just fantastic. It is, we love it. Luke 16, verse 10. It says, if you are faithful in the little things, you will be faithful in larger ones. But if you are dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. And if you are untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? And if you are not faithful with other people's things, why should you be trusted with things of your own? No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. I wasn't even going to do offering this morning, but last night when I was in and out of sleep, and this happens to me a lot, I saw the Lord so pleased with the generation that is faithful in their tithe and offering. I actually saw you guys coming down to the altar and giving your tithe and offering to the Lord. You go, offering just to? Yes, offering, because in Malachi says, you have robbed me in tithe and offering. It's like I teach my kids. They get a gift for their birthday, and I go, okay, 10% belongs to the Lord, and you have to give it first, because that means first fruits. That's what the Bible teaches, but I go, on top of that, you need to give an offering because the Bible is very clear. It's not our money anyways, it's the Lord's, amen? And like we just read, if you're not faithful with little things, Jesus sees everything. He sees how we treat a dollar. He sees how we treat his money. It's not ours, it's the Lord's. So I believe a generation is lovingly being obedient to the Lord and saying, yes, God, I will be faithful in my tithe and my offering. It's not, it's not even a condition. It's actually obedience. And obedience to Jesus is perfection. There's nothing like being obedient to Jesus. Amen? So let's pray. Holy Spirit, it is our joy 
to give the Lord what belongs to him. Move on our hearts right now, Jesus. Lord, you took care of the sparrows. Of course, you will take care of your children, Lord. You're so faithful. It is our joy to give to you, Lord. Whatever we have, our time, our money, our talents, our dreams, they all belong to you anyways, Jesus. We place them in your hands this morning, and we trust you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. There's many ways to give. You're, if you're in the room and you need an envelope, just lift your hand and keep them up, and one of our ushers will come and give you an envelope. If you're watching online, we love all of you guys so much. If Jesus Image has blessed you, you can text GIVE to the number on your screen. If you're in the room, you can also text GIVE to the number on your screen in the room, and we'll be back in just a moment. Moses stood on a mountain Waiting for you to pass by You put your hand over his face So in your presence he would die And all of his It shines now through the air. Now you've called us to boldly see your face. Show me David knew there was something more than the ark of your presence in a manger Messiah was born among kings and peasants And all of Israel saw the glory, and it shines down through the age. Now you've called me to boldly see your face, wash us your face. Show me your face, Lord. Show me your face. And then gird up my legs that I might stand in this world.
Could we all stand, please? Good morning. Let's just close our eyes and lift our hands to Jesus. Lord, we lift up holy hands this morning in your presence, and we're reminded that you inhabit the praises of your people. It's why it feels so wonderful here. You live in the praises of your people. You've chosen to. And because you're here, anything is possible, Lord. Come on, church, just put his name on your lips. Anything is possible. We give you our full attention, our full affection, our thoughts, our hearts. We offer our bodies this morning as living sacrifices. This is our rightful service because of all you've done for us. And so we give you all the glory this morning, every ounce of it, Lord. It's all yours. All belongs to Jesus. And may that be said of us, Lord, until the day you take us home. May it be said of our families that all the glory belongs to Jesus. May it be said of this church that, Lord, that, that what you're doing here would transcend the generations and that our children's children ch children would glorify you and give you all glory. Not unto us, O Lord, but unto you, your word says. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. We worship you and adore you. Speak to us, pierce us in the depths of our being this morning. Heal our bodies, restore our minds, make us more like Jesus, wonderful Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. Can we give the Lord praise? Seal that with praise. Come on, lift, lift the praise. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Blessed be your name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Happy Pentecost Sunday. I'm going to, I'm going to try to find a way to get my message to connect with Pentecost. That shouldn't be too hard. <laughs> Uh, very quickly, if I will be meeting uh, in the Connect class after service, that's for those of you who want to make Jesus' image uh, your home church, you feel like the Lord is leading you in that direction, it would be an honor to serve you in that way. It, uh, it really is a privilege to walk with you and uh, live in God's presence with you. If, if you'd like to uh, just see what the church is all about and uh, hear the vision of the church, Immediately following service, I will be there as well with Jess, and we'll be there to greet you and just quickly share our heart and vision. Somebody wrote down, light refreshments are provided. I don't know how light they are, but that could mean a lot. Uh, hopefully it's not like Shasta or cheap cola, but whatever. Uh, there'll be some, uh, some refreshments there. And then also, uh, very quickly, uh, how many of you are in the ministry? Uh, I know we all are, but... Your vocation is the ministry. Would you just lift your hands? Lift your hands. Okay. Uh, pastors Conference is coming. We had a few thousand pastors and leaders come last year. We're expecting more. We've rented a building that is a thousand seats larger. We'll be at Faith Assembly for the Pastors Conference. Uh, I'm so excited. Uh, Jess will be there. <laughs> and uh, my father in law, Pastor Benny, will be there. Tommy Reed will be back. Bishop Reed at 90. How old is he, Amy? He'll be 91 by the conference. Our worship team will be leading. Francis is joining us as well. I'm really excited about that. Obviously, Jer and Steph and Katie as well will be teaching on prevailing prayer. The Millers from Upper Room, Pastor Randy Needham from The Dwelling Place, and Pastor Paul Teske to anoint the pastors with oil so that they can step out in the healing and deliverance ministry. Amen? Amen. So this, this entire event is around building the church, watching the Lord build the church in his presence from his presence, through his presence. The church is meant to be the house of God before it is the house of our own initiatives. Amen? Amen? Okay, I've got one more thing to share and that is that we are coming to, actually two more, the last is super, super exciting. We are coming to Irvine, California for the next leg of the Jesus Tour and we are using Pastor Jensen Franklin's building at Free Chapel and that is July the 28th. If you'd like to come, the info should be behind me and on your screen. Uh, I, have, I have been ministering in California since 2003, full-time. I became a pastor there in 05, and uh, so I'm very, very familiar with Southern California and what the Lord uh, 
has done, how difficult some people think it can be, but how many of you know there's nothing impossible? For the Lord, we saw an amazing harvest of souls. We saw people sprinting to the altar, thousands registered, and we are coming back. And then we go back again in August, and then we'll be actually at Bethel on October the 13th, and then in Sacramento before that. So we feel from the Lord to sow the power of the gospel into that region, and if you'd like to come, I'm telling you, it is absolutely uh, historic as to what we felt in Southern Cal. And if you'd like to be a part, uh, we'd love to have you. Lastly, lastly, we break ground next week on our new building. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, and... Uh, Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Can we give him glory again? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Why are the serve teams screaming the loudest? Uh, man, no more setting up and tearing down, at least in this city. <laughs> um, but we're really excited. It's next week. There are fathers and mothers flying in from around the world to be part of a very small, just because of the way the land is right now, we don't have the ability to do a big public uh, gathering there. But uh, some of God's dearest friends are coming in to add their blessing, to pray. We'll be burying some Bibles out there and, uh, and anointing the land with oil. And I'm going to be writing a letter to the Lord and to the generations after me that basically says, if you ever come off of Jesus, may the Lord send me back to harass you. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm very excited, and the, the financing for the land is going wonderful. Uh, thank God. We do need to pay it off, and I'm, I'm in faith. It, it, it must be supernatural faith. I'm believing we're going to be debt-free on this land in no time. I just, I just believe it deep, deep in my heart. And uh, when I've, wh what is the number at now total for both phases, do we know? Where are we landing it? Ballpark. That scares me. <laughs> that doesn't mean it went down. Yeah, well usually when you do that. Uh, somewhere in the 20 million range for maybe a little less, a little more. More than 20. Because of inflation and supplies, my word, uh, the, uh, things are not getting cheaper. But God is not getting poorer. And, uh, and I'm so excited about it. I was on the land yesterday just oh, with my son, Benny, actually. And we have a huge cross. Uh, some uh, historians would say that the cross of Jesus this was 13 feet high, 8 and a half feet wide. So we did our best to replicate that. And there's a rose garden at the base of the cross, and then there's a plaque in front of the cross that says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And then we have these beautiful uh, chairs that are uh, in, a, in a semicircle around the cross. And yet, how many of you were grateful for the weather yesterday? It's like a, uh, a nice uh, curveball from the Lord. I was like, wow, I can actually go outside. And, uh, and, um, we sat there and began to talk about the sacrifice of Jesus and the presence of the Lord was just so rich. The first time we prayed there uh, with myself and Jess and her dad, I, I kid you not, you don't have to believe it, I have a picture of it. This happened. Uh, God does stuff. A dove landed from, while we were praying, a dove just flew down and landed from here to the microphone and uh, just stared at us the whole prayer. And uh, Pastor Benny goes, what is that? And I'm like, that's a dove. You have them on all your jackets. What are you talking about? That's, your, that's a dove. You should know. Don't you know? You wrote Good Morning Holy Spirit. Don't you know what a dove looks like? So, uh, so that dove just stared him. He goes, I've never seen anything like this. <laughs> neither, do, neither have I. And then the dove uh, flew off when we finished. It was quite the amen. Uh, from the Lord, and uh, so next week's very special, and uh, very soon we'll be there uh, as a church family, amen, and uh, our children will grow up in the presence of God, they'll be taught the scriptures, 
and uh, hopefully we'll all grow old and maybe we can even bury Carla and Ryan there one day. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? Right by the alligators. All right. Okay, let's pray. Let's pray. We need it. Lord, we love you and worship you. Speak to us. Thank you for your word. Your word that is life, that is bread, is living bread. Your word is truth. That's what you said. Sanctify them by your truth, Jesus. You said, for your word is truth. So we ask you to form us into the image of Jesus. Amen. 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 Okay, we're going to continue uh, with our teaching on the blood of Jesus. How many of you have been enjoying this? Um, there's something about the power of the blood of Jesus that the enemy loves to disrupt and silence the church uh, on. Last week, I talked to you about the absolute relationship between sacrifice and the blood. Um, I think I've mentioned to you before. In fact, I know I have. Uh, I grew up in the Greek Orthodox Church uh, in a very Greek culture. I'm still very, very Greek. Um, when uh, Western American people come in, maybe they'll hear us talking. They think we're fighting. We're just talking, <laughs> just discussing stuff. Um, our favorite cologne is garlic. And... Uh, <laughs> When you get within 30 yards of Jess's dad's front door, there's this garlic eternally wafting out the door. One of the things we did every Easter is we had a lamb that we would raise all year. And then uh, you had a wonderful meal on that Saturday night prior to Easter Sunday. So at the strike of midnight, you would go to your houses, you would sing an ancient song, an ancient hymn. It was very beautiful. Christ is risen from the dead, and by death he hath conquered death. And to those in the tombs he has given life. Isn't that powerful? And uh, then you'd eat a wonderful lamb dinner, and to your shock, your pet lamb was gone the next morning. <laughs> Didn't know how that happened. But I think there is something, listen carefully, not I think, I know, but there is something that is being attacked in the church, and that is this, laying our lives down, taking up our cross, and following Jesus. This is the faith. The crux of the faith is Christ crucified and risen. Period. So it is impossible to talk about the blood and not talk about the one who laid his life down. Today there's a lot of confusion about what true discipleship is. If you're not being instructed according to the scriptures, even if you disagree, you're not being discipled. This is very important right now because uh, there are many wonderful pastors, wonderful leaders. In fact, one of the things I'm so excited to do at the pastor's conference is lavishly honor those pastors. Because there's an assault to dishonor faithful shepherds right now. And uh, there are no perfect pastors. Uh, no churches run perfectly. You can't run a 7-Eleven perfectly. Right. Did any of you have perfect teachers growing up? Perfect parents? I was an altar boy. I've never met a perfect priest. One of the substitute priests, I'll never forget watching him drink so much of the communion wine. I thought, man, he's really getting a full cleansing. And I'll never forget it. I was 11 years old. I had my vestments on. He, he was behind the altar. He just went for it. And then he looked up to heaven. I'll never forget it. And he goes, ha, 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 ha. And I thought, wow. With the joy of the Lord. <laughs> okay, so Christians, listen, Christians do not eventually become disciples. That's not the biblical narrative. In fact, the biblical narrative is that the disciples were eventually called Christians. 
If you read the book of Acts regarding Antioch, it says the disciples were called Christians. Discipleship is the Christian life. And the standard of Christian leadership is Jesus. You're like, yeah, that's right. I completely agree. Have you ever systematically studied what Jesus celebrated in his disciples, what he rebuked, and then how he rebuked them? It would shock you. If Jesus is not the standard, then somebody else is. And if somebody else is, it is not foundationally Christian. For Christ himself is our faith. If Jesus is mere substitute, we miss out on a beautiful invitation. Are are you tracking with me? uh, A lot of our theology would sound like this. I messed up. God was in a panic. He sent his son He cleansed me. He did everything for me. That's true. He washed me in his blood. That's true. I've been buried and raised with Jesus. Absolutely true. Now I am left and empowered to do whatever I want. Not the gospel. Not the gospel. And the breakdown comes when Jesus is only substitute, listen, and not the pattern who is the Lord. He must be the Lord and the pattern. Does this make sense to you? So we must look at Jesus the shepherd if we are going to look at Christian discipleship. Where we don't want to look is at a blog written in 2023. Newsflash. The faith did not begin in 2023. Jesus is origin, source, beginning, and end. He is all things who has filled all things with himself. Jesus is not part of this story. Is this landing? He is not part of this story that we call Christianity. Jesus is the story. And if he's crucified before the foundations of the world, as the scripture teaches, he comes with a certain heart posture. And the heart posture is lamb-like. Lambs do not come to advise. Lambs come to die. So the focus, the intentionality, the specificity of the faith is at stake right now. I honestly think that if, the, if, if Paul and Peter, I've been in certain sessions where I didn't hear the Lord's name me- mentioned once. I did not hear the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. I heard nothing about the blood. I heard nothing about the coming of the Spirit. I heard nothing about his burial. I heard nothing about his ascension. I heard nothing about his enthronement. I heard nothing about his soon coming return. And I honestly think if the, if the Apostle Paul were sitting in the front row, he'd go, that's an interesting message. I never heard that before. Which is not a good thing. We, we have no, there's no mandate. Listen carefully. There is, there rests no mandate on the church to come up with a new message. <laughs> there's no instruction. From the scriptures, it says, come up with something that'll wow the people. The mandate, however, does apply to this. Carry on in the faith, handed down once and for all. And I have news for you. It is still powerful. I don't want demons to enjoy my services. And so... If God cannot tell us what to do, we are not disciples. You're like, I want to prophesy. You sure about that? Because if you prophesy without that heart disposition, you may just join the other camp. I can name you a list of biblical figures who did that. Saul prophesied when he was around the company of the prophets. 
Did he or not? He absolutely did. He also decided to rip his clothes off prior to prophesying. I don't understand that, that strategy. <laughs> it's true. How about Balaam? He jumped in and out, both camps, uh, because he was addicted to delivering the word and not addicted to the source. That's what's happening today. I'm just being honest. Give me a word of knowledge. Give me my address. Tell me where I live. Come on, wow me. Wow me, do it, and then we'll invite you in. Come on, wow me. Make, make me feel special by calling me out, not by telling me to fall in love with God. You see what happens? If the cross is not central, you will build your kingdom. So why, am I, why am I even wasting my time prior to teaching on the blood? Because, as I said last week, a lamb did not it wasn't a blood drive. Yeah. Well, you know, meh, take, you know, <laughs> take a pint. That's not how it went. I want to donate. No. If you bled on God's altar, you died. Yeah. Do you get that? Yeah. It wasn't just a little bit where you could go scrub Israel's sins away. There was something deeper at work. Yeah. Life for life. And that's why Paul says in the book of Romans, offer your bodies as a what? Living. <laughs> in our culture, in our mindset, sacrifice means do something nice for someone when you sort of don't feel like it. Right? I sacrificed. I bought an extra latte for you. Hmm? I gave four more dollars. I know people who tithe to the cent. <laughs> it's God's going, wow, you are something else. I gave my son, and you tithe to the cent. Thank you so much. I needed your money. No, no, no. The culture, the theology of sacrifice is all. You bring all. That's what we do. We bring all. We bring, we believe all the Bible. Uh, even the challenging portions, which, by the way, will never cease in challenging us. They are meant to. The scriptures are never referred to as a theragun or a massage chair. They are referred to as a sword, as a knife, as a scalpel that circumcises the heart. In the early church, uh, they didn't have connect classes. <laughs> in fact, in many early church communities, it was harder to get in to the church, uh, let me say it another way. It was extremely difficult to get in because you had to be approved. Because Romans were sending in spies and if they got into a church, they would kill the leader and the believer. So you had to be vetted. And then prior to being baptized, you had to go through the fundamentals of the faith. We, and the old term for that would have been catechized. You, 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 you went through a catechism of some kind where you agreed with not only here, but in the heart, you offered your entire being to the Lord, and then that was signified in water baptism. That speaks one thing. I am going into the grave with Jesus, and I'm breaking forth from the grave with Jesus. Not with a changed life, with a brand new one. That's the gospel. This is the gospel of the church. It's the gospel of Jesus. It's the gospel of the apostles. Listen to me. L please look into my eyes right now. God is looking for disciples who are in love. Yes. But he's looking for disciples, listen carefully, who understand the bridal paradigm. What does Jesus say in Ephesians 5, or Paul? 
I speak of a great mystery concerning husband and wife. And what is the mystery? Christ and his church. He's awakening us to a truth that Jesus is married to us. And here's the beauty of Jesus. He is the only one who came to die for his harlot bride. He said, I'm going to win this harlot back, this prostitute back. How, do I, how am I going to get her back? I'm going to die for her. There's no story like that. That doesn't happen. Is there any other husband who says, I'm going to die for the wife that cheated on me just to win her back? This is the Lord. So that is the paradigm, right? Yes or no? When you get married as the bride, you give your name away. Maybe I can't hear y'all since this thing's in my ear. I'll say it again. I'll pull a bill. I'll go stand over here. That was very good, Bill. When you get married as a bride in a Christian wedding, you actually give your name away. And you take on somebody else's name. The name of the groom. And then you kiss at the end of the ceremony to seal the covenant where there is a breath exchange and a public intimacy exchange to signify that I am no longer my own, that he is not his, and you are not your own, and the two become one. That is the faith. That's the great mystery. That God came searching for the bride who left him. So powerful. So John the Baptist sees Jesus and he says, uh, he who has the bride is the bridegroom. He introduces Jesus as the great bridegroom right after he introduces him as the Lamb of God and the baptizer and the Holy Spirit. What's he saying? I'm the best man of this wedding. I've been doing my job and keeping the bride close. Now the bridegroom is coming down the aisle and like any best man, it's his turn to now increase and now I decrease and back off the scene. This is his moment. We need more faithful servants of the Lord like that. This isn't our moment. I'm going to say that again. This is not our moment. The church does not exist for our giftings to flourish. If that happens, thank the Lord. But if it doesn't, Jesus is worthy. This is his moment. Jesus is the star. The culture of heaven is that because he is so good in the age to come, he actually shares his glory with us where we receive these glorified new bodies so that we can exist in his presence because without them, we'll burn up like a moth in a flame. <laughs> it's not just like, it's not the only reason that he, we get a glorified body. It's not because he's being nice. It's that you won't make it. <laughs> you, you know, like uh, Jess and I saw this really nice high-end bug trap the other night. We were doing cardio. And it had this beautiful light. And these little bugs would come, oh, that's, that's nice. Drawn to the light, zapped, and they explode. It's kind of like what, what, that's kind of what would happen to us in the age to come without a glorified body. We would just not exist. And so the Lord gives us this body. Here we are in his presence. We are near the throne, hopefully. I said hopefully. Depends on how you live here, actually. Your eternal reward does have something to do with your surrender. It's for another teaching. And it, you see this in the elders receive a crown. And what do they do with their crown? Every time they get a view of the lamb, they throw it down. So the Lord gives them a crown. Their only response is to throw the crown down because of his glory. That is the culture of heaven. May it be the culture here. There's one star. There's one superhero. There's one celebrity. And by the way, his version of being a celebrity is to wear a crown of thorns and die. So this is foreign. This doesn't sound like revival culture. 
It's the gospel. I find it interesting. In revival culture, uh, people will study everybody who saw a move of God. A very few burrow into the heart of the person who saw the breakthrough. Very few uh, have the, the uh, tenacity and the patience to say, what did they burn for? What did they preach? What was their life story? And I'll show you one common thread for, through all of them. Christ crucified and risen. Here's my life, O oh Lord. What did Miss Kuhlman preach? What did she say when she got on the platform? You gotta die. You gotta die. All the kids are like, what? You gotta die. She'd say, I died a thousand deaths. <laughs> what was she saying? I'm carrying my cross. What did Corrie Ten Boom say when she said, God wants to put you on like a glove and every finger needs to be filled? He wants every bit of you. What is she saying? Give it all. Yes or no? This is what all of the champions taught and preached. May it be our message. And I'm telling you, just around the corner of that simple yielding is joy unspeakable and full of glory. You will see things you never dreamt of seeing. On the way here, I was thinking about all the Lord has allowed me to see. Just in this room, 1989, all the miracles that happened, all the miracles we've seen over the last year in this room. Has it been a year? I, I don't know. Yeah, for Sunday nights. All the miracles we've seen here. Me getting saved right there, right there in 1989. Me getting healed that night right here. Me seeing devils cast out. What? There is joy on the other side of yielding. It is great, listen, it is greatness to be humble enough to be told what to do. Obedience is not a bad thing. The scripture says that Jesus learned obedience. It's a good thing. And the spirit of the age is after crushing that, you see? It's after crushing that because it is Luciferian by nature to exalt us and then be our own Lord. Is this, is this landing? I am trying to preach a message and messages that will secure you at the throne. I'm, going, I'm getting ahead of what you might be facing this week because I trust the Lord to help you through that and deal with that. But my job is to see you at the throne one day. That's what I want. That is the heart of a true shepherd. What did Jesus say? Father, I have lost none you've given me. Now Jesus is chief shepherd. I am not. But the heart of any shepherd should be that. I want to see the people God has called me to serve. I want to see them in heaven. All right. Let me get to my message. <laughs> I'm not going to take long. We're going to receive communion here in a moment, and the Lord will touch us in Jesus' name. Amen? Okay, take your Bibles to Genesis chapter 3. And uh, Amy Pazinski, could you uh, help me? Because I'll be back tonight, and I'm going to need my voice for a little, I think. I want you, uh, Amy, to start in uh, Genesis chapter 3, and we'll start in verse 6, and just read through verse 8. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Okay, thank you, Amy. Let's, let, let's take a look here for a moment. Number one, uh, I want you to see that Adam and Eve noticed their nakedness after the fall. 
Now, of course, prior to the fall, they were physically naked. However, I believe that the scriptures teach, I, I, let me say it another way. I believe that there's room theologically to believe that they were clothed in the presence of God. Y yes, naked according to the world's standards, but not naked according to God's. Now I want you to see the response to the fall. And here's what it was. Ultra self-obsession. Ultra self-awareness. Now, it's healthy to be aware of yourself. You know, like Danny says, uh, Danny Silk said, I find it to be amazing that somebody's nose is a half inch from their mouth and they can have the worst breath in the history of the world, yet they cannot pick up their own odor. It's so true. So that we do need a level of self-awareness. huh? But self has become a God to many. And that is a product of the fall. What sets in in such a lifestyle uh, though it's rarely uh, admitted, is shame. Okay, now we're going to see the response to the shame. <laughs> it's funny. Sad, but funny. They sewed fig leaves together. What's that going to do? I mean, the entirety of the world just shifted. As I said before, Every issue that man faces that is evil, dark, bad, and filled with suffering flows from this place, and Adam and Eve come up with the incredible idea to make underwear out of a giant leaf. As someone once said, this is the launch and the beginning of Fruit of the Loom. But Amy, I want you to read right after the phrase, sewed fig leaves together, and did what? Made themselves coverings. They made themselves coverings. Okay, hold on, because there's a narrative here. God was their covering. They walked in the glory of God. They were clothed in his presence. Through their sin, through the lust of the eyes, lust of, lust of the flesh, pride of life. We talked about that last week. That glory lifted. When we talk about the glory of God, we're talking about the Lord himself, not a manifestation. He can manifest himself, but that is not what the Bible means when he talks about his glory. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6, the glory of God is found in the face of Christ Jesus. When Moses asked to know or to be shown the glory of God, in the book of Exodus, when he's in the cleft of the rock, the Lord says, fine, I will show you my glory. And then he goes on to define what the glory really is. He said, hide here. I will cover your face. You can see my back. And he introduces himself to Moses saying, the Lord is, long, the Lord is this, the Lord is that, the Lord is this, the Lord is that. He introduces his personality while introducing his glory. So his glory is him. His glory is him. When they lose his presence as their clothing, they are left to cover themselves. Uh, Amy, can you keep reading? Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you that you should not I want eat? you to look at the narrative here. Adam sins. A tree, let me say it another way. A tree is involved in Adam's sin. Huh? Therefore, a tree had to be involved for him to construct his own covering. So he sins via this engagement with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He has to come up with 
a covering that is similar to that which he sinned with. Then he hides. He goes a step further. So the first thing he does is he, he loses the glory. He then, goes, he, he then attempts to cover himself, which is the equivalent of trying to earn righteousness and forgiveness in your own works. It required work to cover himself. Amen? Now we see something very similar in Cain and Abel. I want you to look at the difference. Do you know what the word Cain means? The, the Hebrew would read like this, Cain. The word actually means craftsman. Builder. Let me say it another way. Constructor. Abel brings blood. That's all for all. Cain brings the product of the earth. His own construction. Just like Adam. Interestingly enough, the Lord rebukes Cain, and, and, and Cain hears this from the Lord. If you would have done right, would you not have been accepted? What, what did it mean to do right? To offer me what I want, not just to do a few good things. Abel brought me blood. You brought me your works. And after, just give me a few more minutes. After Adam and Eve construct their own covering, and that's a very important word, the word covering, the Lord begins to declare a curse. And I want you to look at this very carefully, just very quickly. I'm going to read from the New King James. I'll read this one, Amy. We'll start in verse 17. Then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, not to, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. Number one, he curses the ground. In toil you shall eat of it. God pronounced uh, a curse on his ability to be provided for, basically, because of his own sin. Now look, both, both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field, and the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. This is much different than him tending to the garden. Now he has to work the garden. That, by the way, is not an excuse to not have a job. For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Number two, he does judge Eve. You'll see here in a moment. He says, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. He does curse and, and judge Adam's work and sentences him, sentences him to a life of toil. He curses the ground. And lastly, as I just read, he then, after cursing the ground, curses Adam's uh, future as it pertains to death and him going into the ground. So we have these five curses released. Adam is cursed. Eve is cursed. The ground is cursed. His ability to provide for himself, it's all cursed. It's a problem. I said, that's a problem. But God has a remedy. I said, God has a remedy. Verse 15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Here's the remedy. A man is coming to crush you, devil, because God also cursed the serpent. Okay? And the serpent's future. 
He declared here the destruction of the evil one. But what I want to touch on is the method by which God destroys the devil. Say by death. Say by burial. Say by resurrection. Now, once the message is preached, because this is God preaching the message in verse 15, he, he begins to say, de declare, as I said earlier, the way by which he would destroy Satan. This crushing comes by blood. This crushing comes by death. And lastly, this crushing comes by the introduction of the innocent other. Listen carefully now. Don't miss this. The innocent other is introduced here in verse 21. Look down at verse 21 of chapter 3. Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them or covered them. In other words, Adam, your leaves are a joke. They're not working. They're just causing you to hide. Your own ability will never make you right in my sight. So I am going to take this into my own hands. I'm now, listen, I feel the presence of the Spirit. Listen, now I am going to announce the gospel to you. I'm putting enmity between your seed, devil, and her seed, the seed of the woman to come, he will destroy you, he will crush your head through the bruising of the heel, and now I'm going to play it out in type and shadow and give you an example as to how that flushes out. I'm gonna give you the skins of a bloody animal. First he preaches it, then he demonstrates it. This is how this thing works. Your fig leaf underwear, not, not doing the job. But I have another idea. Listen carefully now. I'm going to smear you in blood. You say, what's that have to do with animal skins? You don't think the Lord went to a leather shop, to Gucci or wherever. The Lord did not buy leather. He made skins, not in a factory. An animal had to die. This is the first introduction of the power of the innocent substitute and sacrifice. No more hiding. Now you're cast out of the ultimate promise. You cannot stay in Eden, which was actually a good thing for, for Adam and Eve, to be honest with you. But God takes over and covers them. And friend, listen very carefully. Joel, help me please. Listen very carefully. Listen. You want God to cover your sin. You want the blood of Jesus to cover you. I, I remember being in meetings like this. In my 20s, I was in and out with the Lord. I was pursuing professional sports. I was doing all of this stuff. And, and that full yes just seemed so difficult. And because of that, it just invited me into a life of in and out, compromise, and I'd come into atmospheres like this where the Lord was clearly present. And while I enjoyed it, I felt like I needed to hide. I, I, I couldn't wait for the meeting to be over even though I knew I needed to be there. What was I doing? Living in shame. Thinking that maybe church attendance was my way of covering my sin. Or watching Jesus' image on YouTube or, or, or even giving financially as a uh, justification to not be all in as though God is into checks and balances. No, 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 friend. No, 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 no. There's one way in. It's all or nothing. It's just the way it is. And it's that way because he is that way. And so, when God covered them in the blood of that animal, some say it's a lamb. We don't know for sure. 
could have been. Makes sense. I said it makes sense. We don't know for sure. But when God covered them in the blood of that animal, it was not just covering them in a red liquid substance. It's not what was happening. There's something powerful. Do not miss this, friends. Listen. Do not miss what I'm about to say. There is something powerful about the blood. There's something powerful about the blood of Jesus. What is it? It's right here. Leviticus 17, 11. For the life. Some of you got it. I'll say it again. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. You say, oh, the blood is the life? No. No. But the blood carries the life. The blood is not the life, but the blood carries the life. The life of the flesh is in the blood. That means when the blood of Jesus covers you, the life of Jesus covers you. Just like Adam was covered in the life of God in the garden, when you apply the blood, when you appropriate the power of the blood, you're appropriating the very life of God. To say thank you, Jesus. Let me read on. And I have given it to you upon the altar. In other words, God says, I have offered you the blood of Jesus. I've given it to you upon the altar, which would be the cross today. To do what? Back to this covering talk again. To make an atonement. That word means to cover. In other words, I've given you the blood to cover you. I think we should all just thank the Lord. I've given you the blood to make a covering, an atonement for what? This is so powerful. Your souls. What did Jesus say? Oh, what good is it for a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And then he goes on to say this, for what can a man give in exchange for his own soul? And the answer is nothing. There's nothing we can give in exchange for our own dark, broken soul. But the scripture says, I've given you the blood. I've given you the blood on the altar to cover your soul. So that you don't have to construct your own covering. Let me cover you, the Lord says this morning. Yes, of course, the blood washes us. But we need a covering. And why do we need a covering? Because the scripture says that the eyes of the Lord, that he himself is too holy to even look upon iniquity. But to those who come to Jesus and receive the preciousness of Jesus, no more does he look at you in your own nakedness and covering. A covering has been offered to you. And from that moment on, God will look at you through a red lens. Through the precious blood of his son. Every, eye, every head bowed and eye closed, please. Through the precious blood of his son. And scripture tells us in the book of Hebrews that the blood of Jesus speaks. It speaks a better word, not that of Abel, not judgment, not revenge, not hatred it doesn't speak sin but scripture tells us it speaks a better word better than that of Abel what is Jesus' blood speaking today this morning over your life over your sin that you know is real that you feel that you're tired of, of walking in you're sick of that bondage today the blood of Jesus speaks and it speaks a better word if you'll come to Jesus, and this is what the blood will speak over you forever, forgiven, washed, cleansed, delivered, 
purchased. Oh, hallelujah. Protected. Healed. Redeemed. Reconciled. The blood speaks all these things. And lastly, it speaks covered. No longer do you face the Lord in your own nakedness, but in the very life of his son. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. This morning, I want to speak to two groups of people. Number one, you're bound with sin and you want to be free. You are tired of your sin. You're tired of hiding it. You're tired of the secrecy. You're tired of the shame. You're tired of the, the, the inability to get yourself free and delivered. You don't need to, friend. You do not need to. And this morning, you feel the love of God flowing. I'm telling you, anytime you talk about the blood of Jesus, the Holy Spirit starts moving. And if you feel, if you sense God pulling on your heart, I am speaking to you. That's the first group. The second group are those of you who one day you were burning for Jesus. You were in love with Jesus. You loved his word. You loved this, the, every piece of the scriptures. You loved worshiping Jesus. You loved his house. You loved his people. And somewhere along the line, maybe it was a fence. Maybe it was just through a consistent, steady turning away that fire in your heart has gone out and you know it in fact when you look back you look back at the early days of your salvation and you compare them to now maybe others around you don't know but deep in your soul you know I, it's not like it was the Lord can do that today if you're one of those two groups I just want you to quickly put your hand up and put it right back down Thank you, Father. Now, I just want everyone to stand, if you would, please. I would like to invite, listen, anyone, anyone who raised their hand or they wish they did. You wish you did. Maybe you didn't have the courage to raise it just a few seconds ago. But friend, I want to remind you of the word of God. This is what the scripture says. If we are ashamed of him before men, he will be ashamed of us before his father and the holy angels. But if we acknowledge him before men, he will acknowledge us before his father and before all of heaven. Imagine the moment of Jesus acknowledging us before the father, the saints, and the angels. What a savior. If you raised your hand or you wish you did, I want you to get down here right now. Just come forward. I want to pray for you. Come. Thank you, Lord. Come. Come. And don't. There is no shame. There is no shame when you come to Jesus. Come. We give you all the glory, Lord. All the glory. All the glory. All the glory. All the glory is yours forever. Thank you, Lord. Come on. Let's give the Lord praise. They're still coming. Thank you, Jesus. Coming from the balcony. I give you all the glory. If you, if you brought someone, they're still coming from the balcony. Thank you, Lord. If you brought someone and you know they need the Lord, I want you to look them in the eye right now. You do the work of an evangelist. You say, come on, come on, today's your day. And then tell them, Jesus loves you. Let's go. And I want you to come down with them. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. I'd like our teams to come forward if you're on these front rows, if you please come. These first front rows, yeah. All three sections in the front row. Come forward. You too as well, worship team. I just want you to begin praying. And I'm going to begin praying now. Without anyone moving, unless you're coming down to the altar, I'm going to ask that nobody move. If you'd still like to come down, there's, there's room. You will not interrupt me. It's my honor. It's my honor to pray with you. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Give you all the glory, Lord. All the glory. This is the greatest miracle. This is the greatest miracle. For those of you who came forward, would you just look me in the eye? This is not this repetitious moment where you get all the words right 
and, and you just punch your ticket to heaven. That's not what this is. This is a life exchange. And it is important what we confess. That is very important. But we must, uh, what, what I should say, what the Lord is looking for is a heart that is longing for Him and a heart that, that wants to be His. So we're going to pray now, but I want you to remember, we are speaking to a person and he's listening. Church, I'd like you to just stretch your hands, please, towards these precious souls. And we're all going to declare this out loud. Heavenly Father, wash me, cleanse me with the perfect and holy blood of Jesus. I have sinned against you. This morning, I confess my sin and I repent of my sin. I turn from the world. I renounce the devil. And I give my full allegiance, my full heart, my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe and I declare that Jesus Christ is born of the virgin, lived a perfect and holy life, that you, Jesus, suffered and died and shed your blood for my sin and the sin of the world. I believe that you were buried and raised again on the third day. And I believe that you have ascended to the right hand of the Father. You are King of kings and Lord of lords. And I believe that you are coming back again to rule and reign. Find me ready, Holy Lord. Thank you for your love. I give my life to you. Teach me your ways that I might know you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, give the Lord praise. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. 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 Oh, can we just offer one more thanks to the Lord? Thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Now, to all of you who came forward, would you just look me in the eye? All of you should have a pamphlet. Have you gotten one? Okay. You don't have to look through it now, but I'm just going to ask that you don't throw it away. That you take the time to look through it. Number one, it's going to talk to you about the importance of reading the Bible. The scriptures are life. This is the most important meal you can have every day. Jesus said that. He said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded from the mouth of God. The scriptures are life. They are bread. And you don't need to live another day in defeat. Not one. The cycles can end now. Church, they can end now. All the cycles, all the guilt, the shame can end right now, today. Okay? The scriptures are food. Number two, spend time with Jesus. You need to get to know him. That only happens through spending time with him. How do I do that? You go into the room, Jesus said, close your door. Talk to your father who is in secret. And your father who dwells in secret will reward you openly. You get to know him in private you'll get to know him in public. It's beautiful. Number three, don't do it alone. Do not attempt to live the Christian life alone. You need people. That's called church. None are perfect. Just newsflash. Neither were you or you wouldn't have come forward. So we're in good company, right? You, we need people and that's called church. Being with the people in the presence of God, life upon life. Number four, number four, you need to share Jesus with somebody, and I want it to start today. What I'm asking you all to do is before you leave this parking lot, I'm asking that you will at least send a text message or make a phone call telling somebody in your life about what happened today in this room. It's very, very important, okay? Number five, be baptized in water. We're really good at it here. Hold you down so long. <laughs> Everything gets off you. And uh, we would love to see you baptized in water and, and, and walk with you through, th uh, through that process into that glorious encounter with the Lord. 
okay? And lastly, I'm gonna pray right now. Jesus made a promise that you would walk in the same power he walked in. He said, you shall receive power. It's Pentecost Sunday, church. You shall receive power. After that, the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And so right now, right now, I'm gonna ask, Court, can you take your instrument? I'm gonna ask the whole church just to begin praying in the Spirit. And I want our teams to just close your eyes if you've come forward. I'm gonna ask our teams just to pray for you, just to lay their hands on you. And church, just stretch your hands and begin praying if you would, as we ask the Lord to, to show them the beauty of the power of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, you are so wonderful and so gracious that you do not leave us to ourselves. You said that this Holy Spirit is the promise of the Father, Jesus. And you said that we needed to ask. And so right now, Lord, everyone who's come forward, just ask like a child, Lord, fill me with your Spirit. We, your church, ask, Lord, that you would fill these precious souls with the power of the Spirit, that you would fill us all from front to back, every guest, every missionary, every guest who's flown in from out of state or out of the country or another city. Fill them, Lord, I pray. Fill them, I pray, in the mighty name of Jesus. In the balcony, here on the bottom, at this altar, wonderful Holy Spirit, begin to flow like a mighty river and fill your people with power so that we can be faithful in these last days. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Thank you, Lord. Amen. Uh, Lily, come here. Just, just give me one second, guys. Put your hand on this little girl. What's your name? Cosette. What is it? Cosette. Cosette. I was watching you worship earlier. Where are you from? St. Pete. Pete. I saw you worshiping so uh, zealously and you were uninhibited. Um, would you just stretch your hands towards this sweet girl? Would you come, come to me? How old are you? 13. 13. Lord, fill her today. Fill this next generation with, with the power of your spirit. Clothe her from head to toe. Be her everything. And use her life for your glory. And for your namesake. Teach her your ways. Teach her your ways. Just keep praying for her. Teach her your ways that she would know you. Stretch your hands, church. Use her for your glory. Give her songs in the night. Let her be a radical worshiper. And let her lead, let her lead the nations into your presence. Give her a voice that will draw many people, Lord, into your presence. Clothe her today. Just pray in the spirit out loud. Clothe her today in your power. Can you pray louder in the spirit, please? Clothe her, I pray, in Jesus' name. Let her know the fire of your presence. And let her be like a token, a, a first fruit of a radical young generation in love with their bridegroom. And I pray, Lord, that you'd even give her a song about the bridegroom. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the precious, holy name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Can we thank the Lord? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Blessed be your name. Okay, I'd like our ushers to come. Nobody leave yet. We're going to receive communion. And the way we'll do that, the way we do it on Sunday mornings is our ushers will come. They'll stand here row by row. You will come forward. 
take the body and the blood, go back to your seat with your family or whoever you came with. I want to encourage you as the worship team comes forward, they will lead you in worship. You can just sit there, get on your knees or stand. Just don't take communion alone. And then once you've received communion, you're dismissed to go in the presence of God. Thank you, Father. What a beautiful morning. Ushers, you can come forward. We're going to serve this group first. What an honor to do it. What a privilege to take communion with a brand new start in Jesus. Amen? Amen. So ushers, let's serve them. Once you've received the elements, guys, you can go back to your seats, and then our ushers will lead and direct you. Father, thank you for your presence. Thank you for your body and blood. Keep us and cleanse us in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. I love you all. Yep. We give the Lord praise. I'll see you tonight. Be here early. Hold the blood. You're welcome to sit or stand until your row is called.
guys, Michael here from Jesus Image in Orlando, Florida. We are so excited to be coming to the West Coast of America, specifically California, and we really believe this is the Lord and that He is about to move in great power and glory in America. And it's an honor for us to be part of that storyline. That being said, we want to broadcast these incredible meetings to the world. As you know, the Lord has really blessed uh, the media ministry here at Jesus Image. We have an amazing team, but at the end of the day, we all know and are aware of the fact that it is the Holy Spirit. We need a separate system to broadcast the Jesus Tour and our other events on the road. The cost of that is $350,000. And so I'm asking all of you to pray and to deeply consider being a part of helping us see the nations tune in to the move of the Holy Spirit on the West Coast. So would you pray about sowing a seed and walking in generosity? I know the Lord will bless you for it as we give back to Him what He's already given us for the sake and glory of His name. Years ago, we felt our hearts burning for a place that would invite wholehearted, devoted lovers of Jesus to come sit at His feet and to hear His voice. What the Lord is doing at Jesus School is just so special. There's really nothing like it. It's like your eyes open and you see Jesus in a way that you've never known Him before. We've seen miracles, we've seen people born again, we've seen people set free. We've seen worship go up in the most beautiful way as Jesus is being adored. And it's the presence of Jesus and the presence of Jesus alone that changes lives. What makes Jesus School so special and so unique is it really is all about Jesus. It's the simplicity of loving Him and being with Him. It truly transforms your life. There is absolutely no substitute for the presence of the Lord Jesus. And that's what Jesus School is. It is a house for His glory and a people who love Him with everything in their heart. When you lay all the other things down, lay them at His feet, and when you just want Him, you will never be the same.